been working out quite well. We started recording. Are you talking about your um, your pivot account um, expiring? Yes, it will expire. Are you talking about? Like, uh, I was going to say control. just an FYI. Huh? When you pay the ten dollars, it's good to, till December. Yes. I have to pay ten. Very good. So I would have that access, but I want my students to have access. So I, <laughs> so I would have to make them pay right now for just a tiny little bit of time. No, I can't. So the students have to pay five dollars. Each one, if you can set it up this way, or as a faculty, you can buy it all for them and offer them. But yeah, I think that's the way I would do in the fall. If it, if it is honestly for me, I, I watch the uh, IO labs. Um, I've been looking at the IO labs a lot. That's one good alternative. We have our five miles up the road is Stony Brook University. So most of the students mm -hmm. there are doing using IO labs. It said they have a big now online physics lab they have had for years. And Tom Hammick, who is the who is the, the, the very, very much involved with all of this anyway. So all my, my students are going to him and etc. They come back and forth. So we have a so probably we'll use this in the future, but it's, it's a big change and I have to have a lot of the faculty and the adjuncts to be okay with this and, and in, in use it mm. and invest it. And they are not there yet, but I can see how people with interactives would be one way for us, at least say in the fall semester and then future semesters, if you know, for them to, for us to have some more interactive labs where they can collect more, et cetera. So I was looking at a lot of things and uh, I was very skeptical at the beginning. It took me about two weeks to like it and I like now. <laughs> that was my experience. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. Took me a little while to get used to it, but uh, it's been working out well. Thermodynamics of flower, what is this? <laughs> Read up a little bit, Glenda. Yeah, uh huh. I'm getting there, yeah. <laughs> How much baking? <laughs> Me? <laughs> yeah. Once a week, there's a cake. Once a week, there's a cake. Yeah. Can I move in? Everybody. Oh, yes. Please. Um, so now, uh, hold on. So you can take over the screen. Welcome, everyone. Let's see. We got 22 participants so far. And as they come in, I will be admitting them in. And uh, Chris and Ray, yes. uh, you can take over. Let me just say something about everybody that's here right now and highlight. Hopefully, you're all seeing this. And today, we're going to have, the, <laughs> as, uh, let me just um, announce you it's Chris Louis and Reagan Grassel. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. And um, it, we'll be going over thinking outside the box about alternatives, alternative ways to evaluate student learning, right? And you're very welcome to participate. And let me just give a little uh, um, the hook for what's coming in the future. There is something already prepared for, uh, well, uh, being organized for April 24th, another for May 1st, another for May 8th. And in the future, Michael and Kareem and Thomas, if you are here in this meeting, you can uh, uh, let me know if, you, if there's anything that you want me to change in this. But, um, maybe you can uh, give your uh, say anything towards the end. That's it. Uh, Chris and Reagan, take it over and you can share your screen and you should be okay. As co hosts, you should have that permission. All right, let me see if I can uh, do this. Otherwise, I will get off first. But if yay, yay. So that worked. Yay. Um, and start. Okay. Is it going to start? There we go. All right. So um, this actually came out from last week's uh, message or uh, TYC Zoom meeting when we were talking about different ways to assess. And I spoke up about what I was trying and so Glenda asked me to um, present 
And this is going to be really informal, but since uh, Kendra set such a high bar last week, I felt like I needed some sort of visuals. <laughs> um, and then Reagan's got some really awesome stuff she's going to share later um, when I'm done here. So mine are pretty uh, simple compared to what Reagan's doing. And there we go. All right, so just uh, to go with last time when we were talking about, or two weeks ago, traditional testing and trying to figure out how to um, deal with time constraints and uh, internet connectivity and as well people possibly cheating, right? Those were all concerns that people had. Um, so something I'm going to try but I haven't done yet is a set of questions that are going to be posted. So this is going to be an asynchronous test. I'm going to post a whole bunch of questions and they have to answer some subset and I haven't quite figured out which ones yet. Um, but I think I'll have different main categories and then what we'll do is have um, students uploading their solutions by some deadline and they also have to um, edit, review, grade someone else's um, to follow along. So that's sort of what I'm planning. Um, and again, a caveat, this hasn't been uh, implemented yet, so I will report back uh, later on when <laughs> we've actually done this. So this is one idea I had. Um, the other one I have been implementing is the student created problems. So um, students are assigned to create a problem within some sort of specific criteria and they have to provide the solution. Um, luckily all semester long we have been following specific solution protocols. So I've asked students to um, lay out their solutions in a certain way. And so we're continuing with that kind of protocol. They are uploading it to our LMS discussion board. And um, the idea there is to have a little bit of peer pressure to do a good job. So this is an example um, where we were looking at, you know, effectively projectile motion. And I've specified the criteria down here. Whoops. All right, let's see if I can go back. There we are. <laughs> so there needs to be um, some vector components that they're going to have to deal with, acceleration due to gravity. I was hoping that someone would come up with uh, a horizontal force and they would do something interesting there, but nobody did. So here's the rubric and it's basically the same for all of the um, problems that I've uploaded or I've asked the students to upload. Um, so partly the creativity is to try to get them to think about something other than boxes. And um, I, I want the question to be clear. So, you know, define your situation. If you talk about an angle, what is it measured relative to? What are your units? That kind of thing. And then the solution based on um, our problem solving protocol that we've been doing all semester. So I thought uh, it would be worthwhile to show an example. So this is um, one student's example and it's kind of a terrible um, handwriting, but I thought it was kind of a cute story about uh, conquering the lion fort. I'll give you a minute to read through it. Hello, everyone. Hello. D D uh, this was who? Dean? Dean uh, Chris. Oh, Chris. Dean had a question. How do you know that those que those, those that that's not coming? Well, it's a cute story, indeed. Uh, how do you know it's not coming from something online? That was Dean Dean's question. But um, so so far they've been handwriting them. Yeah. So having them, um, you know, they they can still copy it off the web, um, but for the most part their wording is 
pretty crappy, so <laughs> it's unlikely it's directly from the web. I mean, they can take a, a problem and just change a couple of words and it would be the same. Um, so I don't know that. They aren't necessarily cheating, but uh, I, I think it's a lot harder to cheat. Yeah. Um, a lot of them actually have been putting themselves in the problems, which I thought was kind of cute, or uh, referring to the current pandemic. So there's been a lot of toilet paper related problems. Oh boy. <laughs> Sorry. I'll mute. Good. Are there any other questions? So I didn't copy the whole solution down from the student, but um, I showed some of the solution here. So he actually drew a fun diagram here <laughs> with the, the cliff and all the things that need to be labeled um, according to the way we have been doing things in the course. So Chris, which course uh, is this? This is a physics one, you know, mechanics. Um, it's the calculus based section. Okay, good. <laughs> so just in contrast to when I give, you know, just a regular test problem, I'm impressed that what I'm trying always to get them to do is draw the picture, label everything so clearly. Do they normally do it this well when you do, when you don't uh, evaluate them this way? Um, yes, because I, force them to. So basically, if this was a regular test, they would get, you know, maybe two out of eight points for just setting up the scenario. So if they don't do that, they don't get the points. And it doesn't, you know, I tried that. They, don't, they, don't, they rather just lose them. <laughs> but I'm glad really? Like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, when we're practicing in class, so I, I have a complete flipped class um, in, in this course. And so they're always working in groups on whiteboards and I walk around and usually I'm like, well, where's step one? Step one is draw a diagram. Where's your diagram? And, and eventually they do it. So occasionally there's somebody who won't do it, but for the most part, they are getting better. Of course, I am showing you one of the nicer examples. So <laughs> good. So, let's see. And Chris, how All do right, you get, so, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, how do you no, get them to participate in the discussion group? Like, uh, I have a discussion group and they, I don't know if they're using inside Blackboard. I'm, I don't give points for that participation. I'm focusing on other things. This, especially as they kicked in halfway through the semester. Some of them, again, they like to use their private little ways of talking to each other, their small groups. Um, mm. I tried more chats in the past, in, but anyway, but it, it's not working this semester. And uh, so how do you get them, they have the habit since the beginning of semester of sharing these things in the group? And Yeah, I think that, I mean, that was a big benefit was that, that we started off, you know, day one, they're in groups and they have to discuss things and share with each other. Um, one thing I used to do, and this is getting a bit off topic, but uh, it takes a lot of time. Um, I used to have students decide on the grade weights for the course. So, you know, how much is each test going to be worth? How much is, you know, quizzes? How much is all the other things that I asked them to do? Um, and that really helped break the ice, but it takes like the full two hour class. But once they, decide and they it has to be by consensus then uh, the rest of the semester they're happy to talk to each other all right do you give points for participation or is more like sharing and helping each other um i do i i oh. call it active engagement so they have to be prepared each time in class they have to be on task it's not worth that much but it's okay. enough to make them pay attention Thank you. All right. So I will turn things over to Reagan shortly, but uh, we had our own mini Zoom, just she and I earlier, about uh, doing some sort of pro project-based assessments. 
So I think she's got some great uh, results there. So if you want to uh, take over, Reagan. Right, so here we go. Continue. All right, let's see. How's that looking for everybody? Good. I'm trying to get it to play. Nice How's this screen share? Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> I told you she had. <laughs> My stuff is, her stuff is uh, going to be like, blow your mind. <laughs> okay, just a minute as I get used to the interface. Okay. Oops, and a seven-year-old. Okay, so Chris and I brainstormed a week ago about alternative assessments. I have a, a large population of differently abled students in one of my classes, and that has uh, really renovated, force renovated a lot of what I've been doing this semester, even before um, the class went online. And so I, um, rebooted my final exam and I just wanted to show you what what's going on and how this is looking. Um, so let's see. All right. So um, you ever see those articles that say like authentic assessments and make yours more authentic. I, I hate that. I hate that word. Um, so I put in a little more like me phrasing. So timed paper and pencil tests really didn't assess fully my real goals in the class. Um, I want students to build problem solving framework that they're going to use, not just in my class. I want them to apply physics to everyday life and I want them to become lifelong learners and experimenters. And so I put that down and then I, I also admit to everyone that online tests really hurt me physically. Um, I hate, I'm obsessed with stopping cheating and I had to chill out a lot about that um, and and now the accommodations for my differently abled students it, it it just was it was a little too much for me so I decided to kind of start from scratch so I've combined a whole bunch of things that I have learned from AAPT and other people so um, Dwayne Desbian has this solve for everything model that he taught us at our two-year teacher like um, workshop where his example was you just take a, a pen and you drop it. What can you tell me about this? Just solve for everything. Um, I've been using that a little in class, so they've seen that before. Um, Bloom's taxonomy is how I've organized this. I taught high school for 11 years before college, and so there's a lot on standard space learning and objectives writing and things like that, so that's a huge part of me. Um, growth mindset grading. Um, conversations with Chris, thank you, Chris and um, conversations with um, developmental math professor America Massaros. And I have an obsession with checklists that I need to acknowledge and you will kind of note. Okay. So my final exam and my third exam are starting with scenarios. So the students have to pick from a list. There's five or six that I wrote. Here's three of them. Um, a cylinder rolling down a ramp. Solve for everything you can a boat floating in a container of water, and someone's bumping the container at a steady rhythm to create waves. What can you do with this? A ballistic pendulum, that was Chris's addition, genius, okay. And so these are things that the students can actually build and make at home. That was an important part of this. You can put a soup can down a ramp and measure stuff. Um, I'm hoping everyone has a ruler, because um, really a ruler and a stopwatch, and I'll talk if you want me to, I'll talk about mass. Um, that's the tough one. But basically, I took Bloom's taxonomy and made an exam out of it. So can you measure things? That's kind of like the lowest level about your scenario. Can you calculate things with those measurements? That's kind of the next level up. Can you use some of the problem solving skills now where you're not just making one calculation, but you're using like the kinematics framework or the forces framework or energy and work together? Can you combine two different frameworks together to solve for something new? And then if you measured something and solve for it, can you evaluate why those numbers are different? 
So, and then these are the percent of points that each little segment has. So my students can still pass um, by getting through the skills category and maybe the combos and evaluate are gonna be my like upper most level scores. Here's the scorecard I gave the students like um, where they, here's, it's a big list. It's like a menu. Here's things you can measure. Check them off. This is what they're worth. Um, here's things you can calculate. So I have a whole bunch of things. And the menus actually really saved my bacon because the students are looking at it going, oh, I would never have thought to try to calculate tension force. But look, there it is. Now I'll think of how to do it. So that's kind of cool. Um, here are some of the skills on my scorecard. Um, drawing free body diagrams, using Newton's laws to solve for things. I threw in a few conceptual skills. I wish I could think of a way to add a few more conceptual ideas to this. Um, so right now it's kind of lame at like state and Newton's third law pair in your scenario. You could use it four times though. I, I don't know. Um, so here's some of the combinations. Um, in my classroom, we name some of the equations because it makes it more fun. So the big ugly, I got that from Dr. Damcott. Deb might be in this conference, so thank you, Deb. Um, it's work energy theorem. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, if you can use those to save for the same thing two different ways, use them together, where that trick were V final in one part is V initial in another. This is for my algebra. algebra based course. So they really need some scaffolding, like reminding them what that would look like. And then the evaluation section. So what they do then is the students choose how to present their information so they can use their own favorite way of communicating with me. So I'm expecting to get a lot of videos or maybe Word documents, stuff like that, PowerPoints. I picked to do a Padlet, which I'll show you at the end because I did do my own scenario and posted it for the students so they could have an example. Really, we'll see what happens. So far, I launched it a few days ago. The student questions have all been very positive. One student is very strategic. He's like, hmm, I wanna be. I have a 79% in your class right now, so I wanna get, you know, 262 points. So like, you know, that's what's kind of going on there. Uh, so now I just want to quick show you the my final exam example. So I've got, I made my own scenario. I called it scenario 42. Okay. A rubber band is stretched back, hits a marble. The marble rolls off a table and onto the floor. I used Padlet because I can post short videos and other things. Um, one thing I am really worried about is cheating like students are gonna go online. I told you my session about cheating. So I do require that they write all, um, <clears throat> excuse me, calculations by hand. And so I just gave them this sample of all these different things that I figured out how to do. I earned 185 points on this and they can take a look and figure out what to do. So right now I am going to take a look at the comments box. And I think the only way to do that is to stop sharing. Is there a way to do it without? Oh wait, something just popped up. So I, I just wondered if there were any questions. Oh, okay, yeah, you, you, you can check your, I think without stop sharing, yeah? Um, DK, could you, could you see that? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I had a question. Okay. Yeah, we have a week available in May. Could you do a PowerPoint um, class for all of us? <laughs> but my other question was, my other question was, looking at the points, I guess I was curious, how could they get too many points and end up with, I don't know, like an A plus 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 in the class or something? I, I wasn't sure how that worked. Yeah, they can. So I maxed it out. The final exam, don't judge me, is worth 660 points. I know it's a weird number, um, <laughs> but I maxed it out at 700. A bunch of students really like missed two weeks in late March because of the kerfuffle. And I wanted to really add in a pillows where they could 
earn back points that they missed those two weeks in a new way. So they can get up to 700 points out of the 660. And there's really 800 and some points available, so they don't have to hit everything. So how long did it take for you to get all that, that all that information, for instance, in the paddle, in the, huh? This is like a work of maybe years. Um, I haven't graded papers in a week. So. Okay, so, yeah, it has been intense lately. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, okay, so yeah, it's it's something that your life hopefully will get easier. No, I I'm especially excited to see what my differently abled students are going to do with this because they had a ton of trouble with the first online exam. So okay, and uh, so they will pick some questions and they they will submit that to you. And how long do they have to do that? A few weeks or? Yeah, I have three drafts. So if they submit it to me early, they get some bonus. Um, and then I give them, you know, say they earn 200 points on their first draft. And then I bank those and then they can keep going and earn more. And so I have three turn in dates for them. Our final exam is due Wednesday, May 13th. And I posted this like Tuesday. Okay. Okay. So they have time. All right. Um, wow. All right. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm really loving all these ideas in the chat. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> it's my, heart. My, Janet. Question, my question is, um, do they photograph their solutions with a, an iPhone and tack them in? How do they get the picture? Obviously, I'm not a much of a techie. <laughs> How do they get the picture into the solution? Right, I uploaded pictures to the app Padlet, which is actually free, but you can also upload pictures inline in Word or um, other stuff like that. I tell you one outcome that I really liked is all the list of, uh, which you summarize the list of all the forces, all the, the outcomes or all the measure, initial measurements that they can make. I, I, I did something like this about uh, uh, sources of experimental errors, right? In the conclusions, I asked them so much to write about source of experimental errors and come up with some of their yes. own. But I give them an initial list of everything that might be happening and it's not applicable everywhere, but you know, everything. So that's, that's useful too. Oh, I wanna see that list. That would be awesome. <laughs> so I uh, think I'm gonna have to steal your idea, Reagan. Um, I kind of already told my class that there wasn't going to be an exam, but if I make it a bonus, I think uh, they'll, they'll be happy as a chance to raise their grades. Um, the, the issue with our calc-based physics one is that it has no lab component, so making it a hands-on thing I'm a little concerned about, but... Right. How does it transfer, Chris, the calc base without lab? I, this is amazing, but that's pretty amazing. So um, the big transfer school is University of Maryland at College Park, and their engineering program does not have a lab with Physics 1. So therefore, our calc-based physics has no lab for Physics 1. I've argued for this for 12 years now that this is a stupid idea and anyone who doesn't transfer to College Park in engineering is screwed over, but uh, that's... Okay, and uh, so I imagine Talking the to Park, then maybe the Department of Engineering is doing these classes on their own. It is physics, but they are catering on their own. So they took over. And I hear, I hear the engineers in wanting to take over a lot of our physics classes, and you cannot call physics anymore, but it's the same thing. But mm, let's see. My, my dean calls our physics classes engineering classes, actually. Okay. <sighs> mm. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> I can imagine that's a little frustrating. Yeah, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be the other way around, shouldn't it? A little bit. Yeah. Okay. But, so, but, you so, know, a little biased here. 
so Kai, Kai is telling us uh, we could make a list of what are the independent variables, independent variables, right? To make a list of possibilities for the students. Oh, nice concept, Anne. I'm taking notes. Well, I tell you, I would like to use Canvas instead of Blackboard because there's so many of these now uh, anti-plagiarism and anti-cheating software, software coupled with Canvas. I hear nothing of that. For, at least our school hasn't paid for Blackboard. I hope if this thing keeps going, that the, the school is going to get, to use some money now to, to, to buy some of these things as, as it keeps going. I hope. We do have safe assign. I don't know if that's a package yeah. you buy, but we have safe assign in Blackboard. You're right. Yeah, so do we. There's a feature in Canvas if you use um, their new quiz tool to actually have algorithmic um, created problems so that two students can log in at the same time and have completely different numbers. Oh yeah, I, I have that in Blackboard. I have two, mm -hmm. I, and that those are the questions I'm creating, mm -hmm. yeah? I get like 20 different, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm killing them, <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> but I'm using that, yeah, so, yeah. Another, in another life, I'll be nicer. <laughs> Next semester, maybe, but yeah, I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so, yes, for my case, yeah, I've been doing just the basic, which is online tests with uh, their uh, randomized numbers and et cetera. And um, so nobody in a class is getting the same numbers. And uh, there are some students who used to be my A students and did not do well because there, there isn't a lot of partial credit. Um, whereas there is, um, so yeah, but the average grade went up and the questions have been very basic and the average grade went up and they have a lot, they had a lot of time to take the test anyway. So they just have to get used. I'm hoping next time things will get a bit better. I'll change more availabilities, uh, certain things that I tightened before I'll make it looser now. But the average was even better than, than previously. Why? Ah, oh, why? <laughs> mine too, mine too. Yeah. Scary. Well, so interesting, the, um, when I've had the students submit their own questions and solutions, the majority of their grades have actually gone down. But I did a poll and asked if they wanted to continue doing this as their exam grade, and they overwhelmingly said yes. So I thought that was really interesting. <laughs> I tried the... Um the first idea that Chris shared with us where they have to upload the solutions. Um, um, the, the only recommendation I would do is, I, I didn't catch it for my first class, but I caught it in time for the second, is put a time limit. Um, once they start the exam, they only have a certain number of, of minutes, hours, whatever you allow them to upload the solutions that will cut down a little bit on, on the cheating. It, it might not completely take it off the table but but it, it cuts down um, and and the the surprising part is some students did better on 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 this option and some students did worse but on average it, it was a, the, the grades were about the same as what I had in class because this was our second exam at this point mm. yeah my student who performs the best on traditional exams she has like a 98% average, was extremely concerned about my new final exam format. And she actually was the first person to spend an hour with me talking it through. I think I convinced her it's okay. <laughs> but I also created a dummy assignment where I, I told them, solve a physics problem. You can either copy it from the book and upload the picture just so that I know you can upload a picture of your solution to make sure that it's, it's you know, Do you have any problems that you would require a graph or the interpretation of a graph or a data table? Were, were you directing that to me? Anyone? Um, I, have, I have graphs and tables in my, in my um, exam questions. Um, I write my exam questions in LaTeX, so it's easy for me to, to upload any of those. Mm -hmm. And I, I then... Um, copy them into Canvas, and Canvas can, can accommodate LaTeX code. Um, 
if, if you set it up that way. Um, I tell you, well, I use most of that for labs, but I find that when you use the ranking tasks, well, the conceptual part, but when I use the ranking tasks, it, it's hard for them to cheat. Uh, if you Google ranking tasks, there is one crazy answer sheet there, that, but it's hard to match and it's not really all the things that we got from Tom. Those of us who were in the <laughs> workshops, we got all the free books and etc. but you can buy the books, etc. And uh, no, no, they, it's hard for them to cheat on ranking tasks, I feel. And I, I do use this, especially in the conceptual part to, to close the loop for labs. Yeah, and some lab tests uh, now, yeah. I have a lot of um, questions where they have to explain things. Right, so, you know, here's a scenario, what's going on, can you apply the physics? And that tends to be a lot harder to cheat on too. Um, and it gives me a sense for how they write so that when they write their own questions, you know, it becomes fairly obvious when they haven't actually written it. There's nothing wrong with, with writing assignments on a, a physics exam under these con conditions. I've used them <laughs> since, since we've moved on to um, remote delivery. I'm, I'm curious about what percentage of the final grade is based on, ex on traditional tests because uh, that we have not only cheating, which everybody seems to be worried about, but what about test anxiety? A lot of students have test anxiety and even though they don't, you know, cheat or not, they still do poorly. So uh, I'm curious in my t school, in my uh, class, tests only account for 50% of the grade. And I emphasize homework because homework is what a day-to-day -day work ethic, which is what really leads to success in the workplace and in grad school. So I give 50% of the grade for homework, 50%, uh, well, 40%, 40%, and like 20% for labs. But um, that way they can work hard on homework and, and not do so well on tests and still get a good grade. And I could care less about cheating. They used to cheat on homework, but I decided I would let everyone use the solution manual and encourage them to use the solution manual for a one problem set that is, a, I call it practice problems they have to turn in. And then I have my own problems that have no solutions manual that they have to do for the majority of their homework points. This method has increased my uh, outcomes by 15 to 20 percent. So I, my question is, do, what percentage of the final grade comes from your test that we're so worried about? I'm about the same percentage as you, Toby. Um, 45 percent mm -hmm. is from three exams, and the rest is between quizzes, um, labs, and homework. I'm about the same. One thing I did since we went online is I've switched over so that half the points on the test are actually from an essay question that I ask my students something from this chapter, apply it to your life, your future job, whatever. And they have to approve the topic ahead of time. And then they've got about a week to do it. Then they submit it a couple of days ahead and the students come into the test already knowing, okay, I've done pretty well in the first half. That's so that eases the tension a bit. I've just uploaded my lab, my, um, I'm sorry, my, my exam to uh, uh, D2L. We use D2L at, at Aurora. And one of the questions actually um, showed up, I, I put it in, in Teams so that people can see it. And I did a small video of a, um, a pair of nested solenoids and I was asking them to take a look at the graph of the data and from the data uh, come up with the um, come up with the magnetic field and then come up with the flux so I've been doing data problems and graphs uh, with this particular exam because I thought that was pretty helpful but they see we'll see how they do but it was um, it was an exam. It was a lab that I actually did in my um, in my own laboratory, and then and then shared the data with them. Well, I, I want to be like you when I grew up. 
No, I'm still, I'm still doing only 20% for homework. And some people in my college look at me and say, oh, 20% is a lot. I say, yeah, well. <laughs> for me, it's a question. You have to balance how much time are you going to spend grading something? Um, because it's really easy for me to just throw out these huge projects and then, and then all of a sudden the grading will pummel me. Um, so that's one thing uh, that the balance between homework and tests, and that's why tests sometimes skew a little higher in my classes because they're a little easier to grade. So one of the things I started doing uh, after, you know, Dwayne's uh, workshops is that my students have to keep a learning journal. And so they have to talk about what were the main concepts, you know, how do you apply it, that kind of thing, what are they still struggling with. Um, partly I tell them it's a study guide. So when they ask me if there's a study guide for the test, I'm like, oh, well, you've got your journal. <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's a quick way. I've actually found I can grade grade them by skimming really quickly and it's a zero one two grading system like you know is it thoughtful and thorough and you have all the main points that's two if you kind of did a half-assed job then you get half the credit and if you didn't turn anything in you get zero um so i can do that you know in, in a, on and off throughout a class um but again it's a flipped class so they're working on things too, which gives me time in class to give them feedback. But it's a good way to catch what they're working on and what they're struggling with and whether everyone's missed out on some main concept I wanted them to get. And it's a sort of a lab skill as well, that of keeping tabs and reporting also. So you are putting that a little bit in, right? a little bit of lab skills. Yeah. Well, in my lab classes, they have to keep a lab notebook. You can turn that in. So that takes forever to grade. Oh, yeah. So the labs are, yeah, the labs are a lot less credited than the lectures, but they take two, three times more to grade. Uh, yeah, it's enormous the amount of time. Yeah. Let's see what else we have here. I'm just wondering if anyone has a, a really cool like assignment or anything that assesses physics that they're like super proud of that's like out of the box. I don't know if it's out of the box, um, but I, I have computational projects in all of my classes. Mm. Um, I, I give them a set of exercises. I, I've been using the pickup um, exercises and projects um, for the last two years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like the fact that they don't have to be tied down to a specific software package. Um, and um, my the first question I got after we moved online is, are we still required to do the uh, computational project? And when I said that I was thinking of canceling it, um, I got about 20 mess messages saying, please don't. <laughs> so um, I don't know if it's out of the box because they like it. Or, um, it, and it's only 3% of their final grade, but um, it, it, it normally deals with stuff we don't cover in class and they like that fact. I think that's that's one assignment that I'm, I'm very proud of and will continue to use. And I get everything from Excel to C++ to Python to MATLAB to Mathematica to software packages I've never heard of that are open source and I, I I say, okay, well, show me that it works. And what I do is I have them take a video of their um, code compiling so I know that they have installed it, at least. If nothing else, they've copied it into a <laughs> compiler and, and made it work that way. Um, but again, it, it's a, I count it as a double lab. So. Something that I've started doing is uh, my quizzes now uh, they get uh, you know online homework and of course you can sometimes copy online homework even though i make that difficult but my quiz is uh, they get assigned randomly one of the homework questions and from the time they find out which homework question it is they have 30 minutes to send me a picture of their work on it and a up to two minute either video or audio of them explaining what they did and it becomes painfully obvious of the ones who say, 
um, okay, I first used this equation, and you can see I divided four by three. They, they didn't do it. <laughs> they have to say, okay, conservation of energy is important here. So that's what I look for in the videos. How do you get that to upload those uh, audio or video files? I just have it in Canvas. There are different ways that you can have questions. I mean, depending on what kind of Canvas question you ask, they can actually upload straight into the quiz or else they can upload somewhere and you just say, you know, the, the submission is a media file. Okay. Shameless plug, but that's one of the things we will cover on May 8th if you come back. Hooray. So I have a different assessment um, that I could share. Uh, my honors classes have to do group projects. Um, but I, so I'm teaching an honors section this semester. Um, I did switch the, so the, the three group projects are, uh, the first one is you have to pick a problem from the first few chapters of the textbook and you have to recreate that problem in real life. And then you have to, uh, so you take a video of it, you recreate it, you take a video of it, you use Logger Pro video analysis to, you know, so say it's like a, you know, a block going down a frictionless ramp. So they can, you know, they can take a video of that using one of our PASCO tracks and the friction and the, you know, the friction, low friction parts and they can use Logger Pro to evaluate, you know, how fast it is going after it's traveled two meters or something like that. So they use the video analysis to do that for the first project. Um, the second project is a mousetrap car. And so they have to uh, use the physics principles that they've learned so far in the class to predict uh, the top speed of the mousetrap car and how far it will go. And that's tricky because there's two sections to the motion of a mouse trap car. There's the part where it's under acceleration as the trap closes. And then there's afterwards, then there's just friction slowing it down. So they have to do, and they have to um, predict it both with Newton's second law in kinematics and then with the work energy theorem. And then they have to use video analysis to measure how far it's gone and what its top speed was. And then the third project is our catapult contest. They have to build a they have to build a catapult and then compete in our catapult contest that we hold every every spring at the end of the semester, which obviously is not going to happen here. So, uh, and they also, with that they have to um, it's that one's a little backwards because they have to take the video first and find the release speed of the catapult and the angle that it launches at, and then they have to predict the how far it goes uh, from that data. And then they do a percent difference between the measured that and the measured distance that we actually found. And they do an error analysis for each of these. So um, I switched that over, the mousetrap car is due next Wednesday. I switched that over to being a, uh, an individual assignment instead of a group assignment. I just thought it would be too challenging right now to have the students try to collaborate on building something right now. So we'll see how well that goes. Um, the group projects are 10% of the overall grade for the honors classes. Um, I'm changing the catapult contest that they have to build a mobile and then do the torque calculations for it being in equilibrium. So that's, that's, what, that's what we're doing for, for that. That's one of our, my alternative assessments. I have an interesting type of assessment that I'm still, because <clears throat> 25% of my tests are take home. So I put into the take home a, a question that is an interesting question that has been discussed in the, the physics teacher journal with an, a little article. And, so I put that online and the article and uh, like this week's te test coming up next week, uh, the question we're doing waves and the question is, if you have pure constructive interference between two waves, uh, each of amplitude A, then the, the new wave should have amplitude 2A, but the energy content of the waves is 
dependent on the amplitude squared. So you have before before they interfere, you have two a square. Uh, you have two a squared amount of energy. But when they do come through constructively interfere, you have what? Four a squared amount of energy. There's something going wrong here. And if you have destructive interference, you have zero. Where did the energy go? So that's a question that is kind of an interesting question. And um, there is an article in the TPT that well explains that uh, basic conceptual difficulty. So I make them read it and then write a couple paragraphs about the article. Gets them so that they use the resource, the physics teacher, in, in, you know, as a resource to learn. So I've done a few group projects as well, um, where they have to learn about some topic and then teach the class. And we were working on that. This is usually my physics three class where I've been um, assigning that. But one of the things they do look at are some of the uh, early experiments um, to do with quantum mechanics. So you know, like Millikan's oil drop and Rutherford's gold foil. And I make them read excerpts from the original publication and talk about how different it is presented in a textbook versus what was actually done and what the motivations might actually have been. Um, but that, that's always an interesting way of assessing as well because they, they have to bring together a lot of different ideas um, in order to create their presentation. But I do like all the video tracking, Maggie. <laughs> we used to do a, a learning community with the cal calculus class and the students had to um, analyze a whole bunch of theme park rides and then we would take them to Six Flags and they'd have to actually measure a whole bunch of stuff while they were there. So, awesome. That. Yeah, I, I wanna do that when, when we start to get more of the wireless probes from yeah. Vernier. I'm, I'm I'm ready I'm ready for that for my honors <laughs> class for sure. Uh, that will be so much fun. Yeah, as, with with re, with regards to physics three, I have a really interesting project that I've had on the back burner with our German professor uh, for the last several years. Um, so she teaches a class uh, that's uh, German history and culture. So it's not a German language course, even though it's in the it's, you know, even though it's a GER uh, prefix course. So um, we, we were taking a pedagogy class together for professional development a few years ago. And it was one of those, you know, collaborate across you know, disciplines kind of projects. And so we started talking about uh, Einstein's 1905 uh, E equals MC squared paper. And you know, I mentioned to her that apparently it's a very readable paper, you know, it's only four pages long. And the, the project started out with the idea of, hey, could your German students translate Einstein's paper for me and my students could then teach the physics to your German students? And turns out she read the paper and she's like, oh no, it's technical German. Even my you know, fourth semester students aren't gonna get that. But um, we decided, that you know, we started talking more about what was going on in Central Europe in the 20s and 30s, and like, what was it about? You know, what was it about Germany and Austria and all these area, you know, all these air, you know, colleges in Central Europe, universities in Central Europe? Why, why was what was it about? You know, that time and place that made Germany such a hotbed of you know, physics research. So the idea was that we would cross together our two classes, we'd get our two classes together and we, our students would do a sort of holistic look at the culture of Germany and Switzerland and Austria and what was going on in Central Europe at the time you know, that made it such a, you know, a intellectual hotbed because there was a lot going on in Germany besides physics just then. But we haven't gotten the opportunity to uh, put that project into, uh, into 
practice, but but someday we'll someday they will both be teaching that those classes at the same time, and we'll get together and make it work. Hey, Maggie, I uh, I had to grab this book. Uh, it's uh, the first edition uh, in English translation of Albert Einstein's work, and it was published in 1923. Uh, it's uh, uh, the Principle of Relativity by Lawrence and Minkowski and Einstein. And on page 67, there is that article that you just mentioned called, Does the Inertia of, an, of a Body, Does Its Energy Content Depend Upon the Inertia of a Body? And, uh, and it is four pages long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've read I've read that paper now because I found a translation when I was looking for that, and and she says that but but it is it's super readable. It's very very unbelievable. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yes, you go, E equals M C M C squared came from this. Right, right. Because normally, you know, when I, when I was an undergraduate, I was the president of the physics society at U of I, and we would get the crackpots all the time sending us papers. I've disproved Newton's law of gravity in four pages, and so you you know you start to think, oh man, four page paper must be crap. <laughs> all right. That gives but, me an but, idea. So there's. Um, so many videos out there that explain physics, but from a different point of view, you know, like uh, you could learn about HVAC and thermo um, and it would be a really interesting, I don't know, this is just a kernel of an idea to like have students view videos uh, from the other perspective of a physics topic and then maybe compare and contrast and then explain why they think it's different than that. Like my favorite thing, we have a police officer come in and do skid tests in the parking lot with us in the summer. I miss that already, <laughs> but he calls uh, friction and other things uh, totally different words and uh, they has totally different names for the same variables that we use. And so we have a good time conversing about why it's different and uh, how actually it's mostly the same stuff. So now I have this great idea. Of, um, all right, we are in, it's 3.58. Um, can I, um, can we have perhaps, um, um, Reagan and Chris, we'll go back to you, but Tom and Kareem and Michael, and, uh, would you like to, uh, give, to say something about future, um, future meetings and, um, just a quick note of what's coming up? Sure, I can do that. Go ahead. All right. Well, um, I'm working on uh, organizing our, the discussion next week about astronomy online. Uh, it's been on my mind because since before any of this, since I run our observatory, um, the, that I haven't been to in weeks now because campus is closed. But uh, the um, there. There are weird ways to do it. One of the things that I've been focusing on is how to get observational experiences to students online. Fortunately, before campus closed, I managed to snatch a telescope and a camera from, from the observatory that's relatively portable. So uh, unfortunately, the weather has sucked in Nevada uncharacteristically, and so I haven't been able to do much observing. Um, I have my fingers crossed for for mid next week before this happens, and I'll and I'll have some things. I uh, let me let me share one picture. I do have a volunteer that got some some good pictures um, that uh, and that that I'll, I'll I'll be sharing with everybody. And and uh, hold on, Tom. I need to make yeah. it for host. Okay. Uh, yeah. There's a. I have a volunteer who has a backyard observatory who took some pictures, uh, most notably, of uh, the should be good. The Atlas Comet. Let me see if I can make this work. Yeah, this uh, this picture of the the Atlas Comet. If you can all see that, that. Yeah. made its close approach recently. Uh, this was taken from Carson City a couple of weeks ago. Uh, 
full color R RGB the hard way uh, with the CCD camera. But I'm, I've got some resources like this that I'll be able to share that are at least s sort of observational uh, experiences. And if the weather clears, uh, I'm going to make some observing video of me actually just steering around and looking at things. Uh, uh, that was that was my idea to contribute, and I hope there are others that that are able to contribute some some resources for astronomy. And uh, my my outside the box was how do you actually get your eye on a telescope when you don't have a telescope? And that that was as close as I got. So tune in next week. I'll, I'll tune in for sure because uh, during the last eclipse, my students and I, we took uh, pictures of, of 42 stars and, uh, on 23 plates and performed the Eddington experiment and we, we were successful. So it was the first time students, I think, have ever measured the curvature of space. And uh, I, I can share the pictures we took. They're just incredible. Toby, could, could you post that somewhere, a link to your data? Um, uh, I have, uh, I don't have the data. Uh, the data is pretty complicated because you have to, to find the centroids and then you have to import it and compare it to the Gaia catalog. And, and then it's a, we're working on a software program to do that. But right now, the, you know, the data wouldn't do any good in a spreadsheet anyway if to, if to, for someone to, to look at. But my goal, I applied for a NASA grant uh, or I was applying for a NASA grant to go down to Argentina and we were going to get money to make a Python program to do the analysis. But uh, just last week, they, I got an email from NASA and said the can this program is canceled because of COVID. So I, uh, so we're still, you know, but in 2024, if anyone's interested, we are going to Mexico to, to a resort and I hope to get about 12 or 15 universities and students down there to re recreate the Eddington experiment. And amazingly enough, we think we can compete with accuracy to the level of radio telescopes with amateur equipment. It's unbelievable. 2024 is crossing over here, like uh, upstate New York. You don't think we're gonna have good weather? No, it's the matter of uh, center line is, the, the point of maximum eclipse is in central Mexico and you double the amount of time for data because yeah. it, the number of your uncertainty depends on N and if you double N, you go up by route two. So we wow. are, we, I'm already uh, getting a resort in Mexico uh, reserved. <laughs> and so it's gonna be pretty cool you know, for people who are inter interested in astronomy. But my goal is, the overall goal is to bring the Eddington experiment into the normal curriculum for advanced labs in universities. All right, um, Karina, are you there? And Michael, do you just want to do your pitch about what's coming ahead or there's time for that anyway? And I just want to say anybody who would like uh, to propose um, another topic for a meeting, go ahead uh, to do it. Uh, so next uh, Friday, you're only going to see Tom talking to you. <laughs> I mean, and, and everybody participate. I'm not here anymore. I will participate. Um, and uh, then Kareem and then Michael and so on. I can, we can help, right, with the access to Zoom, but um, many of you already have access to Zoom too and, and all that. So I am, um, Glenda, I'm hoping that, that um, when it's time for the uh, meeting that I'm hosting that I'm not the only speaker. I have some. I have found a, a few new things that I didn't know about. I'm sure most of you probably knew about them already, but I will share some of the tools that I have been using to make life a little less crazy for me teaching physics online. Um, and then um, I'm hoping that others would be willing to share. So it, it was more like a shareathon, not just just me presenting. Yeah. That's that that was my goal. So I hope I hope others will will be willing to. Um, um, help.
Oh, it, I'm, I'm in my um, dining room. Somebody asked me what is the halo on the side. I'm in my um, dining room because my wife is teaching another class um, online in the, <laughs> in the office. So hopefully by by the um, the eighth, maybe we can find a, a less less uh, reflective room for me to sit in. I didn't want to be in my um, living room slouching on a couch. So that that's why there's a halo to my side here. <laughs> It's not me, that's for sure. <laughs> Glenda, I, yeah. I, I have a question. I, I haven't looked at your repository for labs to use, but is it growing? Uh, All right, um, let me share the screen. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, so I just posted what you have, what you sent to us the other day too. Um, ooh, I got trapped now. Let me see if I can find my, ooh, let, let me just go to this one. Oh, send you. And uh, what do I need to do? I need to go to this. And uh, yeah, so uh, resources and then resources linked to Zoom meetings. So I added something, Janet sent also a few other resources about astronomy. These are just the general resources, lots of little activities. Uh, that are available seats in science, so on. Some of those are mentioned. This is just the first central uh, resource page, but the ones uh, being exchanged in Zoom meetings are here. And then there's the link for the shared labs. So I posted the one you just sent about damped uh, oscillators in uh, uh, Toby. And when I post, I just say damp to SHO. And this is what people see. They see the files you sent, the PDF, the doc. And then I created a readme file with the email that you sent so that there are links for them to, to look at. So that would be a good way for people to, you know, make it more likely that people will use it so that they understand better what's behind, right? Mm -hmm. um, so these are the labs one that you sent, the cosmology labs, et cetera, which will, uh, oh, wow. the astronomy, et cetera, they're all here, right? They need no, to, hopefully thank they- Thank you, go. beautiful. Yes, but this is the case, it's here, but now it needs to be advertised. <laughs> And uh, hopefully in the astronomy meeting as well, and as more gets in, more people will get to know more about this. These are the many Google Drive links that Andrew Young had sent. I don't know if any one of you had looked at this. I have. There are some pretty cool things. He uses a lot of the simulations online, but he has very nice pedagogical questions to ask. Do this, do that. Why is this, why is that? So it's really a nice guidance to use those, those simulations. FAT also has a lot of pedagogical material, right, to support their simulations, but uh, that was nice too. These were the ones I had done. Uh, Maggie, you have yours. Uh, I put here the electron charge mass ratio and the Planck's constant. If you want to send more files to just explain that further, you, you can, or if it's already there, it's good. Um, On my to-do list. Yeah, so then, um, yeah, that's it. Uh, but uh, there's some instructions, so anybody who wants to submit more, it's there. And uh, I will have the recording of the Zoom meeting and uh, any other highlights we had today. And if I can, girls, please give me the, uh, yeah, Zoom, the, the, please send me your um, um, PowerPoint slides and, and we'll post them, okay? That's it. I'm going to stop sharing, but it's there. Linda, I have a question. Yes. Um, when when I'm hosting and for the next, do you want us to set up the Zoom meeting or are you going to set it up for us like you've been doing? You can set it up if you have access. You can, if you have access and if you have um, free, unlimited time, go ahead okay. and send to the, the list. Um, and uh, what else? And then I can continue posting this online. So at the end of the meetings, you know, if there's any material you can send to me or anything that I grabbed. Yep. Okay. So if, if I create the announcement, I can post it on the, um, the take AAPT? Over. Take over at the CP. I, I don't want to take over. <laughs> <laughs> to, you send an email to the whole list. You know the list. Yeah. Is, that's it. You send an email okay. to that list and everybody will know. Just like I've been sending, now you send. Okay. And I've noticed that creating the password has helped with the Zoom um, bombing maybe, so maybe yeah also I, I made a few other modifications there's a lot of options there uh okay. in the um so in the mail from apt they had highlighted that we shouldn't make 
phone uh, access available. It should be only computer audio. And so I also uh, shrunk that, you know, uh, so. Is that, is that list on the, um, on the, no pun intended, list of, of the emails on the committee lists or no? The, the suggestions for the security measures? No, um, I can make a little suggestion. I think Tom, Tom, Tom Herring, you also, you, you have experience with this too? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I figured it out pretty quick. Uh, ju if you just look at, at um, Google securing Zoom, Zoom actually has some pretty good resources of this, here's how you do it, this is where the options are located, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the, it's really pretty straightforward. The one thing that was a little bit tricky for, at least for me to find, was um, turning off the option that gives, that, that produces a link with an embedded password. It does this little encrypted pass, hashed password that is not very encrypted. <laughs> they, they, those can be, but so we, um, it, it's one of those things where it does, you know, the actual link, question mark, PWD, blah, 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 blah. So you can just chop it off when you share the link, or you can actually set Zoom up so that it just never includes that in the link in any invitation anywhere. It was a little bit, I had to dig a little bit to find that option, but it exists. Thankfully, I have a few weeks before I have to do that. Yeah, uh, feel free to, to you know, email me or if you want, you know, or I can, I can find it again and show you where it is, another, you know, in a short meeting or something. Thank you. So I have a question. Um, were these uh, weekly Zoom meetings strictly, did they strictly come out of the COVID-19 fiasco? Uh, these I feel like would be useful going forward um, in the future. Maybe it's a lot of work, but uh, I've, I've found them very helpful. Rebecca, you're right. The history of this is coming from this this thing we're all living through right now. But I'd like to keep this going on. I really like seeing everyone every week. It's, it's you're a great group of people. Yeah, but Greg, you have to shave. <laughs> mm, yeah, you don't, Greg. Yeah, you, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I gotta I, go. I, Thanks, right. Linda. Right. Bye, Tommy. <laughs> We'll share a few highlights about a few topics anyway, suggestions about the making better Zoom meetings more. But I think the key was that um, only uh, through the list, uh, the password was released only through the list. If we start advertising this to everybody, it, it is more complicated. So just like APT does, they ask for you to register first and then you're given the permission and all. So our only per way to do this is to stay inside our list then. They can advertise, but then the passwords stay inside of our list. So they should register to our list first. That's one way we can do that. Well, I also think, um, oh, I can't, get, yeah. I mean, I think once people bomb a physics teacher meeting, I think they probably leave pretty quickly too. So we have that going for us. <laughs> yeah, if the other thing I found out, uh, if, if you're the host, I haven't had to do this yet with any of my classes, fingers crossed, but if you're the host, you can kick people out. Yes, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, but, but it takes the damage sometimes. Right. Awesome. Yeah. You're fast. Linda has done it before. That happened just last time. And I Thanks for letting me back in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they still like you back in, yeah, yeah, yeah. There are lots of little things in Zoom to control that, yeah. Okay, very good. So, um, wow. So the meeting officially is over, and thank you all for coming. And Chris and Reagan, well, uh, let me. Do you have anything else you'd like to say? Thank you so much, girls. Uh, girls, let me call you girls. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're good. Well, I'm good. Yeah, yeah I'm. Fine. I just tried to share with you, Glenda, the uh, slides as a PDF so you can make a link on the database, whatever we call that, repository. Absolutely. Wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. It's going to help me a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you. I also yes, thank want you to very much. Points, uh, thank you very much for well. the presentation. <laughs> yeah, so we, we have to take some lessons from Reagan's uh, PowerPoint prowess. There's a story behind it. Okay. <laughs> that would have to be like a TYC beer meeting.
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> cake, beer and cake. Got it. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, May 15th. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. See, you. See you next Thanks. week. Thanks. Thank care. you. Bye. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Regan. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Yeah. And All right. thank you, Glenda. You're doing an amazing job. Amazing. Yeah, Glenda. We need to send you a crown. Done. Yeah. I'm done. Crown. I tell you, it's Tom now and <laughs> it's all the other. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. I'm gone. Bye. Bye. Bye.